I'm not trying to get rid of online publishing. I'm trying to get rid of the mentality or fight the mentality of free content. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam, and this is the Vice Podcast Show. I'm joined today by John R. MacArthur, also known as Rick, the publisher of Harper's Magazine. Founded in 1850, and still alive and kicking, and still uh, tremendously exciting to read. Rick, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. So tell me about your first encounter with Harper's. Oh, uh, probably. As a reader. I mean. As a reader, my first encounter was at uh, somebody's summer house in, uh, in Michigan, on the other side of Lake Michigan. I grew up in Chicago, and I read a, an, an issue that had a an excerpt of a new novel by Philip Roth, uh, The Professor of Desire. And I wasn't really much of a reader then, but then years later, I met Lewis Lapham, who was editor uh, through the 70s and in the, into the 80s, uh, when I was in college at Columbia in New York. And I was so impressed by his sort of radical critique of the establishment coming from inside the establishment that I said, this is a guy you have to, I have to pay attention to. And I started reading the magazine in really seriously in the spring of 1977, I remember, or 78, and, and I became a devoted reader. When you were growing up, was your household, um, you know, was it a very literate household? I mean, were, were there little magazines all over the place? Were people reading the newspaper and talking yeah. about it? In, in fact, my mother's French. I'm half French. And I get my literary reading side from my mother. Uh, she was a big book reader. And I learned to read in French and, and, of course, in English. And my father was much more politically engaged. He was a businessman. Uh, and not such a big reader, but very politically involved. It was the Vietnam era, the civil rights uh, protests. We were very anti-Vietnam, very anti-daily Chicago machine in Chicago. So yeah, we read the newspapers uh, very, very closely, but we didn't have intellectual magazines in the house. We didn't have the New Yorker, Harper's, the Atlantic, Saturday Review. But other people, my parents knew, did. Mm. And I started reading, seeing those magazines at other people's houses. But I didn't become, we had Life magazine. We had sort of mass circulation So magazines. was your mother mainly reading fiction? She was mainly reading historical stuff? Mainly historical. she was reading fiction. She mm -hmm. was reading, you know, she's the, she got me to read The Count of Monte Cristo. You know, it was a huge life-changing experience for me. When I was 13, I read the thing, I read it in French. And um, um, what she, was it about mythology, the of, Greek mythology. What was mythology. it about the Count of Monte Cristo in particular? I'm curious because I <laughs> often hear people tell me, I'm quite sincere about this, I yeah. often hear people tell me that the Count of Monte Cristo in particular had a deep uh, effect on their lives. Well, it's a great story mm -hmm. for anybody, but I think maybe for a 13-year-old boy or any young ad early adolescent, since it's a story about being imprisoned unjustly <laughs> <laughs> and you're feeling rebellious, the idea of, of outsmarting your captors and escaping in a bag, being thrown into the... Pretend, because he just, Edmond Dantes plays dead, yeah. and they throw him over the side into the Mediterranean, and that's how he gets out. It's just, uh, it's just uh, uh, a, a fantastic story, uh, irresistible story. Uh, but also, my mother got me interested in reading through the Greek myths. There was a, a standard version of the Greek mythologies rewritten for a mass audience by Edith Hamilton, the Edith Hamilton mythology. And uh, I became absolutely fascinated. You know, it's interesting, the other, we couldn't be further apart sociologically, but if you know the, the uh, uh, African-American fiction writer, John Edgar Wideman, he's about 70 now, uh, I'm, in, I'm 57. He grew up in the black ghetto in Pittsburgh. I grew up, grew up in Winnetka, Illinois, on the North Shore of Chicago. Mm -hmm. But his mother also got him to read the Greek myths in sort of popular kids' version when he was a kid, and that's what got him interested in literature. Fascinating. So, so the <laughs> we're, friend, and we're friends now, and I publish him. So the idea of being involved in intellectual life, that's something that first occurred to you as an undergraduate, but did it occur to you that you might be involved in it as an investor, as someone, uh, as a publisher? No, I always thought I'd be a writer and a journalist. My ambition was to become a newspaper reporter. It was a limited ambition. 
although I came up in journalism when uh, the feeling was that journalism was also political. In other was words, was this a reflection of the Watergate era? Yes. Just the idea of a crusading and investigative yeah. journalist uh, changing w history. Watergate, but. But before Watergate, Vietnam, because Vietnam was the absolute uh, uh, turning point in a lot of people's lives. I was too young for the draft, but my brother, my older brother, was drafted and got out of it. Uh, but it was, a, it was something hanging over every family in the country with a draft age, ki draft age kid. And uh, everybody knew that uh, Lyndon Johnson and then Richard Nixon were lying about the war and about uh, the premise for the war. Who were the muckraking journalists of the Vietnam? Was it Seymour Hersh? It was Seymour Hersh with My Lai, uh, in the most spectacularly. But it was also people like Mary McCarthy. Uh, it was people like Martha Gellhorn, uh, who was uh, unfortunately for her f famous for being uh, Ernest Hemingway's second wife, I believe, or th I think, or third wife. But she was a great war correspondent, and she did the most spectacular thing. In 1965, she, she, got the, she couldn't get anybody to send her to Vietnam to cover the bombing campaign, because we just started, we started bombing the North in 1965. And uh, she, finally, she was from St. Louis, and she finally got the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, I don't think to send her, but to at least publish her series of articles. Spectacular. If she made recording. it out there under her own steam. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And that was her style, was always to, she beat Hemingway her husband to D-Day. She got herself, uh, she impersonated a nurse and got on a hospital ship and got to, got to Normandy before Hemingway. Yeah, and obviously in that era, I mean, that must have been particularly challenging to be a woman, to be in that oh, environment. Yeah, uh, but you know, there were, there were many, many great uh, Vietnam reporters and you know, freelancers and also fiction writers, but, but that's what, uh, Harrison Salisbury, who worked for the New York Times, another one, uh, uh, these are all people who inspired us before Watergate. So when you look at the contemporary media landscape, do you see Martha Gellhorn's? I mean, because it certainly seems as though you have enterprising, investigative journalists who are trying to make their way, uh, who are covering stories that are neglected. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it's you know, one could argue that the fact that you still have people like that willing to tell those stories, willing to take a lot of risk to tell those stories, means that our media culture is actually pretty healthy. Well, it's healthy in, in, in so far as there are still individuals willing to take risks. It's not healthy in so far as publishers willing to spend the money to enable them to take risks or to bring back the news uh, uh, that everybody needs to know. Uh, if you follow what's happening in Syria, for example, right now, the, the uh, datelines are all Beirut. Uh, very few people want to go into Beirut and risk their lives. There's a few. Uh, but it's mainly being written from Washington and Beirut, the story. So, so this is an issue you care about very deeply, if written about frequently, most recently in a publisher's letter, but just about the changing economics of the media business. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, on one level, when you think about those correspondents in Beirut and Istanbul, or in Washington, yeah. writing about uh, affairs in Syria, to some extent, you know, might that just reflect caution on the part uh, of this generation? Because again, you know, Martha Gellhorn, she went out there yeah. and she felt lucky that some regional newspaper is willing to actually publish her stories, but you know, she's the one who put herself in that danger. Whereas it could be that now, as a more affluent society in some ways, a society in which people are less willing to take certain risks, you know, maybe that's a big part of why we don't have that coverage, or do you think mm, it's something else? I think it's something else. I think there's just a greater sense of caution politically. Uh, Gellhorn was a committed leftist. Uh, she came from an upper middle class background. I forget what her father did, but she was not a poor kid. Uh, and she felt it was absolutely essential that she go to Spain. She covered the Spanish Civil War also very sympathetic to the, to the loyalists. Uh, uh, people were more politically engaged in the 30s and then again in the 60s than they are today. And there's a kind of laziness that's uh, uh, developed in journalism where the feeling is, well, it's all going to come out anyway. You know, it'll come out on the internet and we'll get it for free. Or uh, we'll let bloggers in Syria do the job that reporters used to do. In other words, uh, the video images of the dead of the dead children uh, allegedly killed by the chemical weapons by the gas uh, that comes from PR people with interests uh, in 
political interest inside Syria. It's not coming from journalists. And the time, the era when a picture by a journalist uh, could change the political discourse completely has really has really changed. I mean, you, you remember the, the photograph of the American soldier being the dead soldier being dragged through the streets in Mogadishu mm. in uh, in uh, Somalia. That was a picture taken by Paul Watson. I forget he's a Canadian journalist. I forget which newspaper uh, had sent him. Uh, but that one photograph changed the debate entirely in this country on Somalia, right? And I don't see that happening now. Although, you know, one thing that occurs to me is that in an era in which cameras are incredibly cheap and pervasive, yeah. one wonders if some of those images that so shook us as a country were also highly selective in a way. Uh, and the fact that actually cameras are so much more pervasive now, the fact that you know it really is true that making sense of any kind of civil conflict now is much harder, partly because you have different people in a position to tell their side of the story. Thinking about, for example, the Free Syrian Army and these various um, you know cyber crimes they've committed yeah. against the New York Times, you know uh, certainly. Um, you know, my sympathies aren't with uh, the Free Syrian Army uh, or with their sponsors, whoever they may be. But it is interesting because it seems that our narratives are complicated. Recently, Vladimir Putin published an op-ed in the New York Times uh, and raised hackles uh, yeah. among many people uh, in the American commentariat. Yet what's interesting about it is that, well, gosh, you know, we have this other voice from the outside that you can take or leave, and it's a voice from you know, outside of the country that is trying to use American language in a way. And, you know, obviously we resent it, but similarly, you know, Americans are entering into other conversations all the time. So I wonder if in a way, you know, it's not so much the economics of the business as the fact that more people are in a position to tell their stories and that inevitably leads to some confusion. Well, it's, but that's not, it hasn't changed in terms of propaganda. I mean, remember I come from, my specialty as a reporter is busting propaganda, uh, uh, challenging propaganda. My Probably the biggest story I ever broke was on the faked baby incubator atrocities in Kuwait City, allegedly committed by Iraqi soldiers. This was pure pop propaganda invented by the Bush administration, funded by the Kuwaiti government in, in exile, and everybody believed it, okay? Which is why I'm a little bit suspicious of the Syrian uh, stories. Uh, but it was intended to drive the American people into war. It was intended to, to push the Congress to vote for an authorization to invade uh, Kuwait and drive so the Iraqis out. So, so journalism is a bulwark against that. You, it's supposed to be, yeah. but nothing's new under the sun. There are just more uh, ways to fake it today than there were, even more ways to fake it today than there were uh, 20, 23 years ago when I broke my story about uh, Naira, the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, who, uh, who faked the story. I mean, she testified in front of Congress and nobody asked her what her last name was. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. So she obviously wasn't in Kuwait when the invasion took place uh, and she made the whole thing up. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not technology that, that drives propaganda. It's just propaganda and politicians that use technology. They learn new ways to do it. Uh, Putin's op-ed was placed by a um, a foreign agent, in other words, a, a lobbying or a PR firm that specializes in, uh, in placing things for foreign leaders. I mean, he obviously didn't write the piece, they wrote it for him. So your view is that independent journalists with a kind of independent economic foundation are crucial for the health of a democracy because only they can cut through propaganda. You said, you said it better than I could have said it. And the Unless you have, in fact, I said this in the Columbia Journalism Review recently. Uh, they asked uh, 50 journalists to talk about what's journalism for, and I said, one thing I said was it should be fun, uh, especially since nobody's having fun doing it anymore. But one of the reasons it's not fun anymore is because it's not remunerative. I mean, you can't get, you can't make a living doing it, and uh, you've got to have journalists and writers respected and paid well if you're going to have enough serious journalists not self-serious journalists, but serious journalists, to do the job of sifting all the nonsense and propaganda get, that gets thrown at us uh, on television, through the internet, on the radio, uh, if you want to get a, 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 a reasonable idea of the truth. And you've got to have credible people. Bloggers cannot afford, as far as I'm concerned, to be uh, credible. They don't have the time or the money. They can't invest the time 
and the money in reporting to find out what's going on. So what you're telling me... Uh, they, re they rewrite other more authoritative sources that they think are authoritative, but those authoritative source, uh, sources have got to be supported by money. So basically, this kind of journalism you're describing is a labor-intensive process in which yielding one substantial story is going to take weeks or months. Yes, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I mean, I wrote the, my publisher's letter uh, in the October issue of Harper's Magazine addresses all of this, and it's behind a paywall. You have to pay for it to read it. But uh, I mention, among other things, a couple of things that we, a couple of pieces we assigned. Uh, one was Ted Conover's undercover report from a, an industrial uh, slaughterhouse in Nebraska, uh, a Cargill uh, slaughterhouse. What he did was he posed, he got a job as a federal inspector, a USDA inspector, and he went inside the plant, worked for six weeks, and came out with a, a brilliant piece of reporting describing the new uh, the new frontier, the latest thing in industrial slaughter. This is the Temple Grandin slaughterhouse, design uh, slaughterhouse, which is supposed to be more humane. Fascinating, complicated, nuanced piece of journalism. It took us two years. It took us a lot of money. It took him taking a math test in order to qualify, because he didn't have the, he had, to, he had to take a math course in order to qualify to be a USDA inspector. So he had to go back to school to take math. Uh, he had to go through the interview process. Uh, he had to get out there. We had to get him, we had to send a photographer out then to photograph the Cargill uh, corrals. Uh, it's a huge, if you're gonna do it right, do it properly, you gotta do it uh, at some cost. Well, one thing I wonder about is whether or not, uh. Uh, when you're looking at the new media landscape. So, right. you know, one thing that we've seen over the last 20 years is a proliferation of new media organizations, some of which are blogger driven, some right. of which aren't. Uh, you know, you have the buzzfeeds of the world, you have the transformation of many traditional media brands like the Atlantic right. into web driven brands. Right. And what I wonder about is that, you know, you could see them as this alternative to the kind of journalism you're describing. Another way to think about it, however, is that Americans watch less television than they used to. It seems that we've actually reached a peak. Uh, so, you know, sitcoms are not as popular as they once were. Right. So if you think about it, this larger pie of the things we consume and engage with, uh, I mean, do you think there's a place for some of this new media that's not exactly this kind of journalism you're describing, but, you know, as an alternative oh. to some of the other entertainments oh, that we've had in the past? Absolutely. And, and some of it is perfectly good pamphleteering. Uh, I mean, if you think of the, the best bloggers, I don't know, uh, Andrew Sullivan or somebody who's, you know, who's got a more serious platform and is really thinking before they write. Uh, uh, you can think of them as a pamphleteer, an old-fashioned 19th century pamphleteer. But to say that the great aggregation of bloggers out there is informing us better than newspapers and radio and television used to, than mass circulation media used to, I'm afraid is a, is a, uh, is a fantasy. And um, uh, there's, a, there's also a cost to society. I'm not a big fan of sitcoms, I didn't watch a lot of sitcoms, but uh, if you go to the higher uh, level journalistic enterprises like, I don't know, CBS Evening News used to be, 60 Minutes used to be, uh, uh, there was a conversation that the whole country could participate in. You didn't necessarily agree with what you saw on TV, but at least you had a national conversation. Now we've got a balkanized conversation that's getting sliced up uh, into, into narrower and narrower uh, pieces and that's not good for democracy. Well, this idea of community seems very interesting to me. So, you know, part of what we seem to be seeing is that many traditional media organizations, if you think about newspapers, if you think about some of the great storied magazines, these were bundles of content. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you'd have a crossword puzzle, yeah. uh, you'd have coverage of a wide range of issues, yeah. and yet, you know, in the case of newspapers, it would be, this is a bundle reflecting the sensibility of a small group of editors designed to cultivate a community in a particular geographical place. Right. So, you know, we root for Chicago sports teams, we talk right. about Chicago news, et cetera, right. and it's the worldview of this city and this great city in the Middle West. Similarly, if you think about a Harper's or the New Yorker, it's a national community of sophisticated people who, uh, you know, want a sophisticated and informed perspective on the world. But in a way, you know, one of the things that the web seems to do very well is form and sustain communities. 
Uh, you know, if you think about some of the biggest businesses on the web, they seem to be all about this idea of community. Um, so I wonder if that should be seen um, as an opportunity. You know, maybe Harper's real job is to form this community, and that serving that community is the way to think about it. And well, we have a community of readers, of like-minded readers, who are interested in writing and, mm -hmm. and reading good writing, literature, journalism, occasionally, as I say in my piece in October, uh, occasionally outraged citizens, people who just appreciate uh, well-written sentences and paragraphs and stories, uh, and photography, because we're increasingly uh, pushing photography. Still photography, I think, is, uh, is, is still fantastically needed. And, and, to th and to just give up on it because of the internet and, and video is, is, is foolish, because you want things uh, to stop. You need to look at them. That's what I like about print is you can look at a, a paragraph or you look at a photograph also and contemplate it, reread it. Uh, it's not just there and, and gone. So I'm, I'm, um, I think, yeah, there's a, of course there's a place for the internet. Anyway, it's, it's there. I mean, I'm not, we're, not, we're not getting rid of the internet. What I'm trying to suggest in my piece is that people respect writers and writing. And the problem with the internet and the publishers who, are, who initially tried to exploit it for money is that they've devalued writing. They've devalued writers and journalism by giving it all away for free. The model was, oh, you know, the idea was, oh my God, you've got this potential audience of anybody who has a computer and reads English in the world. Uh, my cost per thousand for advertising is gonna go down to nothing. I'll be, I'll be rich, well, I'll be rich. And there, the first dot-com boom in, uh, in the late 90s was fueled by this. It burst because, of course, when you put a surplus of information on the market, it drives down the price, like a surplus of uh, labor. Uh, you put too many people working for nothing on the, on the market, the people who want to work for money can't make a living anymore. Uh, so, but this was the publishers who drove it. And I'm now saying, after uh, 15 years of experimenting with this, I, I, I always had a paywall at Harper's, um, uh, it's time to call a halt to it and say, look at the damage this has done to the culture. It's dumbed down magazines and newspapers. It's killed off major publications, which, uh, listen, Newsweek was not my favorite magazine, but it was better than nothing. Uh, they occasionally broke stories. They occasionally did interesting photography and so on and so forth. Um, seeing the Boston Globe sold for nothing, virtually, uh, to some local entrepreneur, the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, th this is not good for American society because well, uh, these are newspapers and magazines that used to send reporters to do thoroughgoing inve thorough investigations and and uh, and and bringing back who brought back the news. Well, if you're thinking about it as a community, though, yeah, isn't there a danger that creating the paywall? excludes some of those outraged citizens from encountering something. So, you know, obviously, you know, there are new potential Harper's readers born every day. Not all of them are already inaugurated. Not all of them are already a part of that community. Right. And so, you know, I guess one question is, you know, you have some publications, uh, The New Yorker, one of your peers being one of them, where their thinking is, we'll absolutely have a paywall, but some of this content will allow to spread so as to keep our brand out in the world to keep us part of this larger conversation unfolding in the internet and perhaps to expand that community of readers uh, that gathers itself around the magazine. Yeah, well, so, the, well the New Yorker is losing a fortune now. I mean, they won't tell you that, but they're, they're, they're getting killed. I mean, it's, there's no advertising. Uh, look at the magazine. I mean, advertising has disappeared. So if you don't, it's all gone to social media and to uh, uh, television. It stayed in television. Uh, the better example is Tyler Brule's Monocle magazine, which is profitable, and he does no social media at all. Uh, Harper's looks very pro-internet compared to Monocle. We have a website, you can read the magazine. If you pay for it, you can read it on, on the screen. Uh, uh, Monocle uh, it does no social media at all. They don't have a Facebook page, and they're doing very well. I think he's, uh, he just gave an interview to Ad Age saying, why would I want to downgrade or degrade my image by participating in something that I think hurts our our platform, our marketing platform. So, so um, the monocle. The, is, I mean, if you yeah. want to do it for free, mm -hmm. you can do what the Guardian is doing. The Guardian is absolutely ideologically committed to everything being free and to getting out of print. They are losing. I'm reliably informed, uh, something like 50 million pounds a year. Eventually, the money's going to run out. 
advertisers and Google are not going to come to the Guardian's rescue. But I think that actually that's a very interesting contrast, partly because uh -huh. when you think about Monocle, this is a magazine that's devoted primarily to luxury living. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have as part of its mission uh, this idea of protecting American democracy. I mean, it's not an American publication. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's a very different kind of animal, whereas it seems as though if you look at the history of Harper's um, and the way in which it's been central to so many American debates, the idea of absenting the magazine from this larger national conversation that's unfolding on the oh, web. We're not absent, though. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, if you read it, you know, you can, you can, you can, it's on the web and people talk about it. They rewrite us, unfortunately. You don't, we don't get any money for it. Uh, uh, Maybe a better example, because I talk about mm -hmm. this in my October publisher's letter, is are two magazines, two publications in France. One is called 21, 21, uh, happens to be run by my publisher, my book publisher, the guy who publishes me in France, uh, which is a quarterly, uh, 15 euros a copy sold only in bookstores. It's the most profitable magazine probably now, or it's becoming the most profitable magazine in France. They sell 50, 60,000 copies an issue. Uh, there's no advertising. Uh, it's a big, thick thing, beautifully designed, beautiful photography, excellent reportage and writing. Uh, but if you think that's just a kind of an objet for the bourgeoisie, uh, look at the Canal Enchaîné. I, I, didn't, I don't mention them in my piece, mm -hmm. uh, which is a weekly satirical and investigative newspaper in France. Eight pages of newspaper. It's broken many big political stories. Manifestly in ugly. Um, uh, 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 publication, not beautifully designed, it's the most profitable newspaper in France. No advertising. And if you go to their website, they say, excuse me, we're not here to, to make it easier for you to, 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 uh, to steal the content. You can go buy it in the newsstand. It's not that expensive, hmm. but they make an investment in their, in their reporters and in their journalism and in the quality of the writing. And it's an excellent publication that breaks, as you say, the biggest, most of the big stories in France. 500,000 circulation in France. Not bad. So is your vision that eventually Harper's will move away from advertising and towards being uh, supported uh, entirely by its readers? Advertisers have moved away from us uh, and everybody else in print. Uh, uh, I think it's foolish because I think uh, advertising in print is a much less intrusive way to get to pe get people's attention. If you looking on, the, on a website and uh, you want to read something for free, um, uh, and an ad pops up in front of you, you're angry. You start punching the thing to get rid of it. And uh, who waits 35 seconds or 40 seconds for the ad to run its course? Nobody that I know of. In fact, the whole country is, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of people who have put ad blockers in their, in their computers. Uh, I think it's a very ineffective, inefficient way to, to advertise. If it, if it, had, if it, would, if it was going to work, there would be no more catalogs. Everybody would be ordering paper catalogs. Mm. Everybody would be ordering online. I mean, reading, browsing online and ordering. In fact, people want to get catalogs, flip through them, and then or place their order on the internet. The same thing would, I think, goes for print magazines and, and, and newspapers. If you see something, you sort of bump into it uh, on your way to looking for something else. Uh, it's a more effective way to get somebody to buy something. In your publisher's letter, you describe... But we haven't, we're not giving no. up on advertising, and we want advertisers, and I think eventually advertisers are going to come back uh, to paywalled magazines that respect uh, their readers and respect their writers. Although I wonder, I mean, from their perspective, what's the... So do you imagine that eventually other magazines are going to go your way, uh, that they're going to sort of recognize this business model is broken oh, and then... absolutely. You're going to have to, or they're going to, all going to go out of business. Uh, the, I had an extraordinary phone call from a former Harper's intern. I can't tell you who it was because he was a, you know, it was a private phone call. He's now the editor of a, a well-known publication in New York. And he said, I loved your piece. I think it's just the greatest thing. If only more people would say what you're saying about respecting writers and the value of writing and charging for it and so on and so forth. And I said, well, what are you doing over there? It's your publication. Well, it's still free. I said, well, how can you say this to me if you're, not, if you're still giving it away online? And he said, and, he, and he, indeed he said, the quality, uh, difference in quality between what we put online and what we put in print is radical. We do, we'll throw anything up online without editing it, editing it really. 
but we're very careful about what we put in print. And we pay more for the people who write for in print. So, so why don't you change your ways? Well, I can't because nobody else will. Uh, I, I, if everybody else agreed to stop putting it out for free, then of course I would do it, but I just can't do it when everybody else is, is giving it away for free. And I, I, as a matter of fact, I talk about that in my piece. I say, you know, that's lemming behavior, and I'm not going to be a lemming. It, I will it's suicidal. Say, I will say that there are some publications, I'm thinking of Ars Technica, for example, some yeah. of these publications that have emerged in the last uh, 10, 20 years that seem to be doing very high quality work uh, that's reported uh, by serious people who are compensated uh, reasonably right. well. Uh, and and it partly reflects this unbundling process, the fact that people are gravitating towards more specialized publications. When you look at some of the basically successful print publications, uh, if you think about the Financial Times, The Economist, uh, et cetera, uh, these are publications that tend to be oriented towards a particular kind of information that people right. want to pay for. Whereas, you know, opinion is, is yeah. so pervasive and so common that it's very difficult to get people to pay for it. So it seems that, you know, it's, it's threading this needle. It's this chunk of content that you guys produce. Because, of course, you know, Harper's does, you know, you book reviews and other content. The Harper's that's not Index, just that. this yeah. which is the page of statistics and so on. And yeah, yes. so, so, it's, so, you know, I wonder, I mean, does it make sense to, you know, if you look at the atavist, byliner, matter, you have some new business models where people are trying to get, uh, you know, these new startups are trying to get people to pay for particular stories. So, I mean, my, it, It's already a failure. I, I mean, I can tell you that the... the uh, pop-up essay, what do they call it, the Amazon singles is, uh, mm -hmm. is now widely understood to be a failure. Uh, you can't, it's literally, it's, I, I, people talk about micro payments and I always say Amazon singles is microscopic payments. You know, we we're talking about 99 cents for an essay that took somebody a lot of work to write and other people to edit, to prepare for publication. It's no business model. You gotta sell people on the whole idea, the sensibility of the magazine or the newspaper. Um, uh, or, or, or the particular book that you're selling. It's, it's just, it's, there's no money in it. There's just, it, I, I've looked at it, people have encouraged me to do it, and I think it undercuts everything Harper stands for. So 10 years from now, what do you imagine Harper's magazine will look like? When you describe some of these uh, other magazines, you know, I wonder, you know, Monocle being a good example, you know, these tend to be magazines with a kind of heavier stock that right. have a different look about them, that have a different visual look. Right. Uh, do you imagine that Harper's is going to change in those ways as well over the longer term? Well, we're already uh, running heavier cover, uh, heavier cover stock than our competition. And uh, you look at other magazines, they're getting, instead of trying to inc increase the value of the, of the product itself, the physical product, they're trying to cut corners, uh, reduce, they reduce the trim size, uh, they run lighter paper that doesn't feel as good and doesn't reproduce the images as well. Uh, we're going the other direction. We're using heavier cover stock, heavier text stock, so that the photographs will look better on paper. Now, if people in droves, because we're selling subscriptions online, in other words, you can, you can subscribe to Harper's right now through Zinio, but very soon be t uh, through our own app, uh, and you really want to read it online or on your, um, on your uh, handheld device, your, I your, I your iPhone, uh, you can do it. But I don't think it's as satisfying uh, uh, a, a way to look at the magazine, and it's still a tiny minority of our readership. You know, we're a circulation of 180,000. Uh, you know, we've got a few thousand subscribers on, on, uh, on Zinio. Uh, mostly it's foreigners who don't want to pay uh, the extra char the mailing cost for having the magazine. But I can't tell you the number of people who say to me, oh, it felt so good to hold the actual thing in my hand instead of looking at it uh, in this sort of uh, truncated version, no matter how hard we try to make it look good on the screen. Because we try, you know, we, we're, our production values, I think, online are excellent. But it just doesn't have the same feel or the same look. But my, again, my yeah. argument is not, I'm not trying to get rid of online publishing. I'm trying to get rid of the mentality or fight the mentality uh, uh, of free content that uh, writing should be free, that writers shouldn't be compensated normally the way other workers are. I mean, it is hard to put out an issue of Harper's Magazine. I just had my, this is, I don't go for vanity publishing, so I've, I've been writing, uh, I've had a separate freelance career for years. It's the first piece I've ever done for Harper's. It is so rigorous, the editing process. You can't imagine how rigorous it is. 
and and uh, this is this had this is worth something, and the readers need to know this. The larger world needs to know this. Another point I, I try to make is about fact checking. Everything we put in print and online is fact checked. Um, there's this new ethos or new idea of crowdsourcing. Where you, so what if you get it wrong? Uh, somebody will notice it was inaccurate and fix it later. Well, that's crazy. It's irresponsible. That's absolutely crazy. I think that's you know it's 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 very, but it's very pervasive. Well, you're not alone and be concerned about the relationship between the quality of our democracy and what's happening to various media organizations. And it occurs to me that uh, you know uh, you, uh, David Bradley, more recently Chris Hughes, a number of people um, who've you know experienced uh, success in some other domain uh, have uh, purchased great American magazines uh, and invested enormous right. resources in them. Uh, now, however, we have some organizations like ProPublica, right. uh, uh, the Center for Investigative uh, Reporting, other organizations that are trying to rethink the business model and trying to support reporters who are doing labor-intensive right. work that's very long-term work that doesn't always have an immediate payoff, right. uh, and then use other media organizations as channels for distribution uh, of what these reporters are, are developing. And I wonder what you think about that approach uh, as a way to see to it that this high quality work is still done. I, I salute them, but the problem with uh, any uh, organization that's dependent on donations is that it's a victim, it's a, 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 a vulnerable to the whims of its donors. And if you get too far into that and you're not independent, financially independent with your own revenue uh, coming from readers and subscribers and uh, a dispersed group of people, uh, you will find foundations leaning on you or pulling their support because they don't like what you're doing because they think it's politically incorrect. It doesn't matter if it's right, left, center. Uh, if you're dependent on foundation support, you're, you're always going to be vulnerable to uh, somebody pulling the plug on you. Do you think there's also a tendency for magazines to pull their punches when they know about what their readers want and what their readers have in mind. If your readers have a particular kind of sensibility, things that offend that sensibility are the kind of things you might tend sure. to avoid. Sure, I mean, it's as old as the newspaper business. I mean, the New York Times covers uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan more carefully than they cover Williamsburg and Brooklyn, where we're sitting. That because, might no longer be true, but be, I wonder. Yeah. Well, because because the the, the retail shop the, the retail shoppers mm -hmm. uh, who the advertisers are trying to reach live on the Upper East Side by and large. Mm -hmm. I mean, Madison Avenue up there is very uh, very very important to the New York Times. Yes, Williamsburg is getting more important, but 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 sure. So there's a tendency for the New York Times to to pay more attention to Manhattan and the Upper East Side than, other, than the other boroughs, than the poor people who make up the bulk of the city now increasingly. Uh, but that doesn't mean the New York Times can't distance itself from its own marketing mission and occasionally do really good work that, uh, that uh, results in no revenue at all. And that's what you want. You want uh, readers supporting a magazine or a newspaper uh, for the whole package. And saying and so that the, the newspaper or the magazine can say, look, this doesn't interest or concern uh, our best demographic, but we're just going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Is there any disagreement within Harper's about these issues and your vision, or would you say that uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, people are aligned around your vision uh, of how? Uh, Magazines like yours should approach oh, the internet. Oh yeah, there used, well there used to be a disagreement because uh, everybody was web besotted and oh my God we have to be you know modern and we have to give it away and and if we're going to be heard or just or just if, you know if we're going to be part of the conversation we got to give everything away and and uh, so we had many arguments about this and I used to say to people if we don't have subscribers the sort of subscribers who are willing to pay for what we're doing we have no future. And I'll give you an example, actually. I, I caved in on one article, uh, the Guantanamo uh, suicides piece. We did an investigative piece that challenged the official version uh, of why those three guys died in Guantanamo, why they allegedly, the government said they committed suicide simultaneously. And you'll remember the famous, uh, I think it was Cheney who called it asymmetric warfare. Uh, why three people would commit suicide simultaneously to upset the American authorities, I can't really explain to you. But anyway, we got 
one of the um, uh, army um, uh, guards uh, to tell his story to us, and it challenges very effectively the, uh, the, the story. Anyway, we put it out for free. It bombed on the newsstand. We won a National Magazine Award for that, for that report. Uh, but um, I'm not persuaded that people wouldn't have paid for it otherwise, you know, that it was compelling enough for people to pay. Putting it out for free, uh, I don't think made any difference. I don't think it had any more impact or any less impact because it was free. Uh, all it did was cost us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and made it harder for us in, in, in theory to launch the next investigative piece. Uh, has Harper's had to charge its subscribers more over time in order to address we're the changing now, economic we're, landscape? We're in the process of raising our rates and I'm gonna push them as high as I, I feel I can, I can persuade people to pay because uh, it's got to be reader supported in in the majority. We're still going to have advertising. There's still advertisers who recognize the value of the audience we reach, and who support what we're doing. Uh, but also, you talk about. Uh, I think you were getting at the question of undue influence, bad influences um, uh, pushed or or imposed either by political power or advertiser power. I mean, wouldn't uh, a reader trust a magazine even more if they knew that the real support for it came from the readers as opposed to, or to a dispersed group of readers as opposed to five advertisers? Do I mean, you, there you did used to get into situations where magazines and newspapers would self-censor because of, of uh, they were afraid of offending advertisers. It's happened to me. I've had advertising contracts worth hundreds of thousands of dollars canceled uh, pharmaceutical companies, auto companies, because we ran pieces critical of their, of their, uh, of their businesses and, or of their personnel. Uh, it's much better, much safer, if you have the, the, the majority of the revenue coming from, from readers. Do you worry about losing younger readers as the rates go up? Uh, well, I worry about losing younger readers because uh, they're learning to read too much on the internet. I call it snippet journalism in my piece in, in, uh, in uh, Harper's in the October issue. And I, and I worry that uh, the capacity to read a narrative at any length is, may disappear. If that disappears, we're all finished uh, as a democracy and as publishers. But I find so many brilliant young people, many of whom have come to work for us as interns, uh, who still are into reading long books, long articles, really thinking about things, reading more than one newspaper, getting more than one source of information, that every time I start to get cynical or depressed, uh, they revive my hope. So, and the, the reaction to my piece has been gratifying. I'm getting a lot of young people writing me saying, you know, you're right. And writers themselves realize that I'm right because they can't make a living anymore. You wanna be a freelancer? You want to get a book contract and support yourself uh, just writing? It's virtually impossible today, virtually impossible. And I wonder if, you know, 20, 30 years hence, even if we take the, the most gloomy scenarios about how the media business is changing, one wonders if there will always be people like Martha Gellhorn who are willing to subject themselves to great danger uh, and do this work even if this work is impecunious um, and dangerous. Uh, do you think that you know the supply of people willing? Because that's what I wonder about. It, because when you look at the life, it could be that you had this brief halcyon moment when you had uh, a publishing industry that was flush with cash, yeah. uh, and you know advertisers were you know all um, you know, enthusiastic about uh, the media business. But it seems that you know, whenever I read the biographies uh, of many great writers, uh, including writers of you know. Uh, narrative nonfiction, you know, great journalists. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem as though they were living high on the hog. No, <laughs> you know, it seems that many of them were making great financial sacrifices no. to do that kind of work. So I wonder if, to some extent, that's baked in the cake. If you're doing a kind of work that's about um, democracy or that's about getting recognition for yeah. oneself, that you know, you're not necessarily going to get some of those material rewards. Well, there's a big difference between getting paid poorly and getting paid not at all. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about now is a whole culture of paying people nothing. Uh, also paying people in these content factories, uh, you know, uh, whatever, 30 cents, a, it was 10 cents a word to rewrite stuff that other people have really worked at. And that's, you know, that's, it's, 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 it's exploitative of the workers, 
but it's also um, uh, very bad for the readers. They're not getting the quality stuff that they, they used to get. You got to get paid something. Gellhorn did get paid something uh, eventually, and uh, uh, she made a living as a writer, and other people do the same thing. Seymour Hirsch doesn't come from a wealthy background. Eventually, uh, he made a living. And the way we used to do it uh, as journalists was you, you start out as a newspaper reporter, you, get a, you, you, know, you, you, you develop a reputation, you get a book advance, uh, maybe you quit being a daily reporter, you do your book, and then you sort of live from assignment to assignment. That's the sort of um, uh, uh, difficult life that you're describing. Mm -hmm. But there was always another advance or another speak speaking engagement, another fee, another freelance assignment. Uh, I'm on the board of the Authors Guild. Uh, all my colleagues, except for the best paid, the richest brand name writers, are suffering because nobody wants to pay them anymore. They say, could you give me 5,000 words? I, I quote to Mark mm -hmm. Kingwell uh, in Harper's uh, from a few months ago in my essay. Uh, can you give us, you know, uh, uh, 3,000 words uh, of quality prose for nothing? And I, <laughs> I mean, that's, what, that's the question you're getting more and more. Uh, or will no. you speak for free? I wonder if to some extent this is also a simple supply and demand question, partly because when you look at the various ways you know, economic life has changed, for example, think about the hyper-production of PhDs and the number of people with doctorates from prestigious research right. universities who struggle to find purchase uh, you know, at a traditional university. You've got educated people who are happy to write, uh, happy to write to build a reputation, happy to write to you know uh, build yeah. a name for themselves, uh, and so you know people who are you know who try to be distinctive in various ways. You know maybe right. that's the way that this has changed. So you know I think that when you're thinking about the world of you know 20, 30 years ago you had this fundamentally smaller supply of people who could do this work, partly because you had fewer publications. Um, and yet it could be you know, this more diverse supply that we are getting things of value, despite the fact that it's putting some pressure on the people who find themselves in the middle. Well, I, I would dispute the value of a lot of the stuff that's coming out over the internet for free. I think a lot of it is just garbage. It's just gibberish. And it's the best of it is rewriting authoritative sources. I mean, Google, what is it other than an aggregator of work that other people have done uh, and then re redistributing it and then selling advertising adjacent to it? Uh, it, doesn't pr it doesn't add anything. There's no added value in Google except speed. And uh, Google clearly has a bias in favor of free re websites. I think you can experiment anytime you feel like mm -hmm. it and see, that, see that's the case. And by favoring the Huffington Post, which is, for example, a, a catastrophe for freelancers and writers, uh, uh, they're, they're essentially stealing from the people who uh, work at this for a living and do good work, do quality work, to give somebody who adds nothing. It is true, however, that the Huffington Post, you know, does have a lot of people who work for free, but it also it, has it, only people who oh, work for no, free. Oh no, no, but but it absolutely has many journalists on staff, many investigative they journalists have, they on have staff. They have some editors, but they don't have any anything you give to the Huffington Post. Well, no, is well, free. well anything, yeah, yeah. but they, they yeah. do hire they do hire reporters. For example, one of whom, Ryan Grimm, is a guy who's written for Harper's in the past, yeah. uh, and who's done a lot of really great muckraking reporting um, about uh, you know corruption and malfeasance in Washington, D.C., you know, things that were central themes. I'd like themes. to know how much he's being paid. Well, you know, well, well, but, but there, there are, but the, what's, what's interesting, what's striking about I'm the Huffington Post is that know. as their audience has grown, yeah. they've actually increased the number of journalists who are on staff. So it seems as though, you know, there absolutely is the rewriting component of what they do, but they seem to still see that there's value. And, you know, this is a very bottom line oriented, profit oriented business. Uh, and yet, you know, they're building up their reporting staff partly to compete with some of those traditional entrenched brands like right. the New York Times, the Washington well, I'll, Post. Well, I'll make, I'll make a daring prediction mm -hmm. to tell you that the, and suggest you that the Huffington Post will not be around in about five years because they're losing a lot of money. They are not making money. They're not, uh, she sold this idea to, to uh, I've forgotten who to she's AOL. to AOL mm -hmm. uh, and took her money out. As you'll, you'll recall that she didn't take any stock. They offered her stock. She said, I'm only taking cash because she's getting away with murder, Ariana. I mean, I think she's a nice person, uh, you know, she's politically uh, on my side on most things, but but I think they're losing a ton of money and it's not gonna go. It's like Tina Brown with the Daily Beast. It just can't go on. But it's, it's an un, unsupportable uh, uh, publishing model. But are you at least rooting for the attempt? I mean, as no, long as nothing to post No, because they're hurting all my friends, all my colleagues, all the people uh, I know who've spent their lives 
learning the craft of writing, I'm talking fiction too, but uh, uh, nonfiction, and, and uh, suddenly finding it uh, undercut by people essentially rewriting their work. Well, well what I mean is this. Yeah. Given that the Huffington Post is hiring reporters and they are attempting to do more in the way of investigative journalism yeah. and paying for it, and they're partly paying for it by getting eyeballs onto this universe of content, and a lot of that content is people writing for free partly because they're advertising something else on their own behalf. Yeah, Let's put yeah, it that yeah. way. So if we have this new viable way to finance real investigative journalism, wouldn't that be a positive development for democracy? Sure, in your but I, I, again, I just go back. My prediction is it, can't, it won't last. It's unsustainable. There's no revenue to be had. And why would you advertise on the Huffington Post when you've got umpteen million other places to advertise on the web that are more focused on your product? There's, just, there's no advert. There's no, there's, it's sort of like uh, she's a mass circulation magazine of, of the uh, sort of, of the life uh, model, the old uh, life, weekly life, in the sense that, you know, she's covering everything. She's trying to be every, all things to all people. There's no market for it. I mean, there's no advertising market for it. Well, and clearly there's no uh, subscriber market for it. Well, one thing, you know, when you talk about how a lot of the writing on the internet is gibberish, and I think, you know, yeah. no one would disagree with you. There's certainly plenty of gibberish out there. It's also true, however, that when you have niche communities, when you have, you know, small groups of people uh, who weren't necessarily able to break in to some of these magazines that you know had very high standards, uh, had a lot of quality control, right. but they also were trying to address a mass audience, and so they weren't necessarily attuned to the interests of this group or that group. You know, wouldn't you agree that there's some value in the fact that you have um, this universe of content so that people with very specialized interests, interests that weren't really heard in this world in which you had a relatively small number of publications with those megaphones. Well, you'd have to make the argument more broadly that the country's changed for the better. Uh, and I keep saying, I don't see that the political oligarchy that runs this country has been at, in the least uh, disturbed by the internet or by Google. In fact, Google's working uh, hand in glove with the government to spy on everybody. So, and so, and so are all the other uh, so-called uh, uh, search engines. I mean, they're searching and seizing your private uh, information and and, and uh, looking in your bank account, presumably, and trying to figure out what they can sell you, but also just spying on you. So I don't, I don't see uh, this mass uh, uh, media that Google and the search engines and the internet have created as necessarily helpful in terms of promoting democracy. But uh, I also make the argument, because it's too, it's too early to know how it's going to end, uh, that it's, it's incredibly vain of, of, of the internet producer, uh, 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 promoters to suggest that it's revolutionary, especially since it's controlled by three corporations for the most part, when you can see examples in our recent history of people with little mimeograph machines in Eastern Europe fomenting revolution against the Soviet Union. I mean, I always use the example of Samizdat. These were uh, pamphlets printed on, uh, made on mimeograph machines in the 1970s, not so long ago, that absolutely uh, 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 revolutionized the discourse in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, uh, in Romania, in Hungary, and so on and so forth. Poorly produced, poor quality samizdat. And so you're telling me that the internet has had a bigger, or this kind of discourse, your, the ideal discourse on the internet, uh, uh, is, is it had a bigger impact than Sami's dot had in Eastern Europe? I don't see it. I don't see it. So you're. I, I am. I am glad that um, I will say one g uh, thing about it that's that's been I think positive is the internet as a mass medium makes it harder uh, for traditional media to self censor. In other words, the New York Times, to give you an example, a uh, horror story in 2004, just before the election, which everybody should know about. Uh, where James Risen, one of their ace investigative reporters, who the Obama administration is now persecuting, uh, found out about the original NSA uh, uh, wiretap program with no warrants. Uh, this is, uh, we're talking October 2004, just before the election. Risen takes the story to his editors. Uh, uh, they, get, they get calls from the Bush administration. Salzberger and Bill Keller go down to meet with uh, George Bush at the White House, and Bush persuades them not to publish 
uh, this story because of national security. You'll destroy our anti-terrorist operation. But of course, had they published the story, it would have caused a firestorm of criticism of the Bush administration and might have caused Kerry to win the election, might have pushed Bush out. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Risen just, uh, just sucked it up and didn't tell anybody, right? And whoever leaked the story to him didn't tell anybody. Uh, a year later, when his book was going to come out and reveal it, the Times was forced to publish his story, and it caused a big stir. But by then, it was too late to have any influence on the political process. Today, with the menace, uh, I say in quotes, of WikiLeaks, people like principled people like Snowden, who I really admire, uh, of just dumping it on the internet, uh, forces traditional media to respect uh, uh, leakers a little bit Rick, more. Rick, that seems like a out. pretty big caveat, I've got to yeah. say. I mean, it, it does seem as though that is something that is a very powerful but, advantage that a more distributed media system well, has. Well, but it was, also, uh, it was also possible for Ryzen to do it on his own. I mean, for whatever reason, Ryzen source and Ryzen decided not to put it out. I'm just saying, with Snowden as an example, and WikiLeaks as an example, uh, a leaker might say to themselves, uh, you know, this might be easier than I think. On the other hand, it didn't stop the fact that there was no internet, didn't keep Daniel Ellsberg from dumping the Pentagon Papers, giving the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post and the New York Times in 1970, uh, uh, excuse me, 69, uh, I hope I'm getting mm -hmm. the year right. So it's all a question of the political motivation of the leaker and of the journalist. And I don't think, I think the, the, the web is mostly neutral. I think in the case of uh, WikiLeaks or the, or the case of the New York Times self-censoring, you now see the New York Times helping WikiLeaks, uh, publishing a lot of their stuff. And, uh, and uh, Partly due to that pressure, partly due to that. Well, I, I, that. Would, I hope so, I hope so. But that doesn't I, in any way subtract from my argument that journalists and publishers should be paid. Ryzen is a paid uh, employee of the New York Times. He's a good reporter, and he should be compensated for what he, d he does. There's no way Glenn Greenwald uh, could do what James Ryzen does. He just can't. He can't. Although he is, he is paid. But, he's, mean, not he a, is but a... he's not a reporter. He doesn't mm -hmm. know how to, you know, I mean, I'm telling you, to be a good reporter, to be a good journalist, takes a lot of years uh, of, of learning. There's no training for it. There's just learning on the job. Well, I'll and, let and Greenwald is not a reporter. I'll like let Glenn Rice Greenwald is. argue on yeah. his own behalf. One of the big developments in the web has been the rise of web video content. Uh, this being one example of it. And I wonder if uh, Harper's has thought at all about producing more video content. We thought about it, uh, but we can't do it as well as people who know their the business, like you guys do. We're not good at it, uh, and to try to do video versions of an article. We're good at publishing articles and editing articles, uh, which just look, I think, crude and amateurish. Uh, plus, it's very expensive. You know, you gotta get someone to film it. It takes a lot of time. Uh, whereas a reporter with a notebook and a tape recorder or whatever can go anywhere and do any, or a camera, can do anything uh, cheaply, much more cheaply than a than, than, a, than a, somebody with a, with a, who has to have production values. I mean, I just don't think the production values were capable of, of prov doing, providing the production values for a video uh, that, uh, that somebody who's good at it knows how to do. I've, I've worked with a lot of photographers and a lot of filmmakers. Hart Perry, who did uh, uh, Harlan County and uh, American Dream with Barbara Capel uh, and so on. Uh, I, we went out to Ohio, uh, just the two of us, because I wanted to do a story on a, a, a spark plug plant that was being moved to Mexico because of NAFTA. I'm a big f critic of free trade. I wrote a book about NAFTA. Uh, and I watched Hart do what he does. He's so much better at it than somebody, you know, who's just sort of doing it part-time or, mm. or, or uh, occasionally. It's, it's not comparable. In fact, you can watch our little video online that we made. I wrote an article for a, a news for the Le Monde Diplomatique. But watching hard work persuaded me even more completely that we shouldn't get into that game. We should concentrate on what we're good at. Uh, and that's the value added in Harper's is the editing and the writing and the rewriting and the fact checking and so on. And it's for people who want to read. It's not for people who want to look at videos. Uh, 
it's more and more, as I said, is for people who want to look at beautiful photography too, though. You've devoted over 30 years <clears throat> of your life uh, and a lot of resources to Harper's Magazine, to making it work, to making it flourish. Uh, do you ever think about other things you might have done? Do you ever have any regrets about uh, all the blood, sweat, and tears you've poured into the magazine? Well, I think, I used to think about going to politics, but politics is hopeless right now, unless we get a, an aroused, s angry citizenry. I mean, you see what happened to Occupy Wall Street. They just got swept under the rug. They got driven out of, uh, uh, out of uh, lower Manhattan. They got, with the, the uh, sort of acceptance and support of the Obama administration, they got wiped out in cities like Portland and democratic cities with democratic mayors. Uh, uh, there isn't a really great atmosphere right now for a, 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 what I would call a, even a reform movement in politics money dominates it and so on and so forth. So I think I can do more good politically and socially by publishing good writing and by focusing uh, reporters and writers on subjects that will move politicians, we hope, or move other citizens. But if you could go back in time to 1977 when you were first taken with yeah. Harper's and, and you were really excited about the world of ideas, right. uh, do you think you might instead become a community organizer or a rabble rouser of some kind? Well, or I, just I did, take you know, to the streets? I, I, did do pol I did do a lot of politics and I did uh, work for candidates. I worked for George McGovern and I worked for, uh, you know, I, I picketed in front of a and on behalf of the F United Farm Workers and I did all that sort of thing mm -hmm. and in Columbia we organized a protest about uh, the university's endowment being invested in companies that had interest in South Africa. We did all those things. Mm -hmm. But as I said at the, be at the beginning of the interview, in those days, journalism looked like uh, a great way to do something politically useful uh, and have an interesting life and career at the same time. It, you can't anymore because you can't get paid. I mean. Nobody except the top top writers and some lower lo and some and some reporters are getting paid anymore, um, and it's destroying the craft of journalism and of writing. Uh, the consolidation of the book publishers, uh, the uh, uh, the reckless predatory pricing of Amazon, which is putting independent bookstores out of business. You know that Amazon. I, I'm appalled by the by the uh, the. the, the the cheering uh, at the Washington Post for, for Jeff Bezos taking over. I mean, he's gonna, he, they're, gonna, they're gonna be very sorry uh, he became the publisher of the Washington Post. He's not interested in journalism. He's not interested in making trouble or you know, telling a, an alternative story. He's interested in Jeff Bezos and making money. And uh, he doesn't have any community spirit. He pays his people lousy uh, wages. He's, it's a disgrace, but people are saying, oh, no, Amazon, uh, he's the new paradigm, he's the new model. The new model is as old as John D. Rockefeller. You undersell the competition until you put them all out of business, and then you have a monopoly. You lose money on every sale, because he loses money on virtually every sale of a book. Monopolies are hard to maintain <laughs> in this kind of world where it's easier to start a, a rival, but I... Uh, he's, 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 headed, he's headed there. He's mm -hmm. headed towards having a dominant... He's, do he's now dominant in the ebook market, and before long he's going to be dominant in the hardcover uh, 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 market. So, uh, that's the other thing that bothers me about the the, the uh, pr promoters of the web as a, as a way to save America or save American uh, democracy. You have three major internet companies that dominate the business. Google, uh, Facebook, and what am I thinking of the third one? Uh, maybe it's two, it's Google mm -hmm. and Facebook. And you have Amazon dominating the publishing business. We're not headed for more democracy, we're headed for more monopoly. Well, thanks again, Rick. I really appreciate your Thank time. Thank you.